econ students, this is Jacob Clifford. Welcome to the Microeconomics Unit 1 Summary Video. In this video series, I'm going to cover all the key graphs and all the key concepts for each unit, but I'm going pretty quick. So jump on board and let's go. Now we're going to jump into Unit 1 Basic Economic Concepts. Now if you've watched this video before and you're here just to review, you can click ahead by clicking one of these. Again, we're going to cover five different concepts. We're going to look at what is economics and talk about scarcity and opportunity costs and trade-offs, stuff like that. Then we're going to jump into the idea of key terms, a bunch of different key terms if you're new to economics. Then we're going to talk about economic systems. Then we're going to talk about the idea of the production possibilities curve. And then finally, I'll talk about something called comparative advantage. The first thing you should have already done is got the ultimate review packet. It looks like this. It's on my website and what you do is you watch this video and as we go through, pause every once in a while to work out the questions and draw the graphs and do the other things that are inside the packet, okay? Now before we jump into the content, I want you to drop your pencil and I want you to do something, all right? Right now, take your right hand and I want you to do this. Thumb out and then pinky out. Thumb out, then pinky out. Thumb out, pinky out. Just like this. All right, now stop. I want you to have both hands. Do it with me. Thumbs out, pinkies out. Thumbs out, pinkies out. Just like this. All right. Now what I want you to do is over again, except this time, thumb out, pinky out, thumb out, pinky out. It's all right, so switch. Looks like this. Now it might seem stupid to you, but there's actually two main reasons we did that, and they're essential. First, I want you to recognize that economics is the same way. It's gonna start off real easy. Economics is just logic, that's all it is. It's just a bunch of logic puzzles, and it's very intuitive. So it starts off really, really easy, and you go, oh, this is so easy, and with two hands, ah, oh, I can do this all day. And then all of a sudden, it starts getting tricky, right? Like drawing the graphs or doing the calculations. It's gonna happen in this video. We're gonna start off talking about the idea of comparative advantage. Very easy concept, countries should specialize in trade, right? That makes sense. And then you start doing some calculations, calculating the opportunity cost. It's a little trickier, but not that hard. And then we'll start doing something called terms of trade, and it gets a lot more difficult. So go slow, make sure you get the concepts, go through each one, and then by the end, it'll be really easy to do the hard ones, okay? Now the second reason for this activity was to find out if you can participate, right? When I ask you to do it, did you do it? Did you even try? Now if you didn't, you're probably not gonna use these videos the right way. You're never gonna be able to do economics if you don't actually try. I mean, when you see me do this, it looks like easy. I can do this all day long, and I can do all the calculations and draw all the graphs of economics really easy, but it's gonna be harder for you to do them, so you gotta practice. So when I say pause the video, pause the video and write down that key term or do that calculation because it's gonna help you. So please participate. We're gonna start off talking about what economics is. It's the science of scarcity. Scarcity is the idea that we have unlimited wants and limited resources. So in your class, it's the first thing your teacher is gonna talk about. Most people think economics is about money. It's not, it's about limited resources. So economics is how we deal with the idea that we can't have everything and we're forced to make choices. It's really how individuals and societies deal with the idea of scarcity. Now, there's some key terms I want you to go over. There's a difference between microeconomics and macroeconomics, and there's actually two different courses. So if you're in college, you're probably taking micro or macro, and they're the same thing for the AP test. Microeconomics is the study of small economic units, so looking at firms and individuals and their decision making, and governments as well. But macroeconomics is looking at the big picture, the entire economy, like inflation and unemployment and gross domestic products and how the economy is doing. Is there a recession? How can the government help to get out of a recession? Should the government help? get out of a recession. These are all concepts you'll see in macroeconomics. Trade-offs is another key concept. It's all the things you give up when you make a decision. But they're all the things, not just one. So what's the trade-off of watching this video? Well, you could be watching some other video. You could be hanging out with your friends. You could be sleeping. The time watching this video has a cost, the things that you're giving up. But you can't do them all, right? You can only actually have done one. The one best thing, the thing you gave up, is called your opportunity cost. It's the most desirable alternative when a choice is made. Now, most people think when we talk about costs, we're talking about dollars and cents, but it's not just that, right? There's other concepts. For example, who you should date. You have to decide, what's my opportunity cost? If I date that girl, if I date that guy, who's the person I'm giving up by dating them? Now, this concept is the most important concept in economics. And most importantly, it sets you up for what the point of the class is. This class will change the way you make decisions. It's gonna enlighten your mind to allow you to make better choices. Opportunity cost is the key to that. Whenever you make a choice, you gotta think of, well, what am I giving up to make this choice? So this happens for individuals, businesses, for the government, 
sense? This idea of opportunity cost is huge. Okay, there's five key economic assumptions. I'm gonna go over each one of them pretty quick. The first one, all resources are scarce. We have unlimited wants and limited resources. And because of that, we're forced to make choices and everything has a cost. Your teacher probably already told you there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? So everything has a cost, something that you gave up to get it. Everyone responds to incentives and acts in their own self-interest, right? And then for number four, everyone makes decisions by looking at the additional benefit and the additional cost of your decision. So you weigh the benefits and costs of every decision. And last one, life can be explained kind of, can kind of, with graphs. You can use graphs to explain life. You can explain the economy with graphs. It's not perfect, but you're gonna see a lot of graphs in this class, starting here in unit one. There's a couple other key terms I wanna cover really quickly. First one is the idea of investment. Now, when you hear the word investment, you think of stocks and bonds and retirement accounts, not in economics. In economics, investment is always when a business buys machines machines, tools, and capital for their own business. So they're, they're buying things to improve their business. Now I use the term, I use this term capital. You're gonna see that too. A lot of people think capital is money. No, no, no. There's actually two types of goods. There's consumer goods, which are made for direct consumption like pizza, and there's capital goods. Capital goods are tools, machines to produce stuff. So blenders, ovens, knives, those are the things for a pizza company, that's their capital. Now there's also something called human capital. Human capital is the knowledge and skills required to produce things. So like a doctor goes to school to get human capital and you can improve those things over time. Now another thing you're gonna hear is something called the four factors of production. When you produce something, if you produce a computer, if you produce a table, if you produce a cell phone, there's resources that go into it and they can be categorized into four things. Land, labor, capital, and some people say entrepreneurship. So inside any product, there's certain resources go into it. Who owns the resource? determines what kind of economic system you have. Now let's look at the big picture. Scarcity means there's not enough for everyone, so we have to figure out the best way to allocate our scarce resources. Now how we do that determines something called our economic system. There's three, three main uh, economic questions every society has to answer. What goods and services should be produced, what, uh, how it should be produced, and who consumes those goods and services. So how do you figure this, how to run society? Well, basically the idea is if you answer these questions, the answers are all the government decides. The government decides, that's one way to run your society. And there's another way where individuals decide. So the, the way these questions are answered determines your economic system. It's the method society uses to produce and distribute goods and services. Now there's really just two main types we're gonna talk about. We go a lot more detail in other videos, but the idea is centrally planned and free market economies. The centrally planned economy is one where the government owns all the resources. It owns basically the workers and tells them where they can work and what jobs they should have. The basic ideas came from the idea of Karl Marx and there's a bunch of other people who've pushed the idea of uh, centrally planned economies. Now, free market or capitalist economies come from the idea of a guy named Adam Smith. He basically said, let individuals decide what to produce and how to produce it and who gets it, and let the market do it all. Oh, that's called capitalism. Now, your standard AP or college introductory course is gonna talk about free market economies. They're gonna focus on those because really that's what most of the world is doing. The most important concept in capitalism is the idea of the invisible hand. The invisible hand is the idea that society's goals will be met as individuals seek their own goals. So a business can't get rich and can't make money unless they do something that you want. Like if I produce cars, I gotta make awesome cars. I gotta make awesome computers. I gotta make awesome phones. If I don't, then people aren't gonna buy them. So they gotta make other people better off. And so society's resources will go to the right place based on what we want produced. Competition and self-interest regulate the free market system. Now, there's all sorts of situations this doesn't work with monopolies and externalities and other concepts you're gonna learn in this course. But the idea of the invisible hand is the reason why this computer was not made by the government. That camera was not made by the government. A lot of the stuff around you is not made by the government. It's regulated by the government, that's true, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. But we don't want the government saying exactly what to produce and how much to produce and who gets it. That system hasn't worked. And that brings us to the idea of mixed economies. A mixed economy is a system that has both free market and centrally planned like parts to it. Some government involvement in different things, more government involvement in some countries than others. But if you wanna learn more, go ahead and click on one of these. You've got economic thinkers and you've got economic system. I did those with the crash course people. There's also a video of me going to China where this Chinese lady checked me out. It's pretty funny, take a look. Anyways, let's move on. Now it's time for the key graph in this course, something called the production possibilities curve. 
Now your teacher might call it the production possibilities frontier. The point is it's all the same thing. It's basically a model that shows the alternative ways we can use our scarce resources. It's gonna show trade-offs, scarcity, opportunity cost, efficiency, all on one graph. Now it starts off with a chart. This chart showing bikes and computers, A, B, C, D, is all different combinations. So we can produce all bikes and no computers, or all computers and no bikes, or some combination between. So if you actually plot this, you come up with a production possibilities curve. Each point represents a specific combination of the two goods we can produce at full employment using all of our resources. So if we take the chart, put it on a graph, it's going to look like this. You've got bikes, computers, and you plot the different points and you've got, boom, right here, production possibly is curve. Now, a couple things you need to know. First, any point inside the curve is the idea of inefficiency. If we're producing only two computers and two bikes, we're being inefficient with our resources. If we're producing any point on the curve, then we're actually producing what's efficient. Right? We're producing, uh, using all of our resources, all of our workers, all of our factors of production to produce this stuff. And outside the curve, you can't produce that quantity. There's just not enough resources, right? So we could, if there was more technology and uh, better resources, we could produce out there in the future. But for right now, for whatever reason, we cannot produce right here at point G. Okay, there's a couple different shapes to this graph, and I want you to take a look at it. Let's talk about calzones and pizzas. Notice that when you produce another pizza, you lose one calzone. When you produce another pizza, you lose another calzone. When you produce another pizza, you lose one more calzone. Now, the opportunity cost here, it's constant. When every single time you produce a pizza, you lose one calzone. That's called constant opportunity cost, and it shows you that resources between the two products are very similar. Right? There, you can use resources for pizza, the same resources for producing the calzones. Now it's going to result in a production possibly as curve that's a straight line. Now let's look at a different scenario. Let's look at pizzas and robots. Right here, when I produce the very first robot, I gain one robot, but I lose one pizza. When I go here, I gain one more robot, but now I lose three pizzas. Later on, I gain one robot and I lose 10 pizzas. Notice, I, I lost only one pizza here, and now I'm losing 10 pizzas? Something's going on, and it's called the law of increasing opportunity cost. As you produce more of anything, the opportunity cost to produce it's gonna get bigger and bigger. And the reason why is because resources are not easily adaptable between the production of these two products, pizzas and robots. Let me explain why with an example. If we're producing combination A, we're producing all pizza. So all workers, including workers that are better suited towards robots, are working at producing pizza. Now when we move to combination B, we're moving out those scientists and those people who are good at making robots. We gain one robot and we don't lose very many pizzas because they're not particularly good at making pizzas anyways. Now if you keep doing that, you're going to keep moving resources away or, or out of producing pizzas towards robots, but eventually you'll start using the resources that are better suited towards making pizza. For example, right here, we get only one more robot, but we're moving away these pizza makers who that's what their job is, right? Luigi working in the back of the uh, pizza restaurant, he's way better at making pizzas than he is robots. So the opportunity cost is super high. Remember, it's 10 pizzas we have to give up moving from D to E. Again, this is called increasing opportunity cost. Let's see if you understand it with another example. We've got forks and spoons, forks and apples. Which one of these is a straight line and which one is a boat out curve? Well, right here. Forks and spoons, straight line, that's constant opportunity cost, and a boat out, forks and apples, that's increasing opportunity cost. The idea here is you produce more and more spoons, you're gonna give up the same amount of forks each time. But as you produce more and more apples, you're gonna give up a little bit of forks, and then more forks, and more forks, and a whole lot of forks. Now, I've made a bunch of videos explaining this concept. In fact, I've made something called Ecom Movies. If you haven't seen them, take a look. But I've explained it in this video. Also, click here, here. I haven't, I'm not gonna talk about shifting the production possibilities curve in this video, but there is some practice questions on your packet. Make sure to try those because it's pretty self-explanatory. If for whatever reasons we have uh, like new technology, this entire curve can shift outward, right? We can get more forks and more apples. Anyways, go back and watch one of these videos if you need more details. One of the things I do want to cover is the idea of growth in the future. So take a look at two different countries. We've got Panama over here. We've got Mexico over here. Let's say here's the production possibilities curve for Panama. They can produce consumer goods and capital goods. Let's say they're producing a certain combination, which is producing a whole lot of consumer goods. Now their future growth curve, I'll put right here, is out here. Right, so they'll have growth over time, they'll be able to produce more in the long run. But over on this side, take a look. Let's put another country, there's Mexico, and they're producing this combination. Less consumer goods, which sucks, they're getting less bananas and clothes and stuff like that, but they are getting a whole lot more capital goods. The question is, what's gonna the future curve gonna look like for Mexico? Is it gonna be the same distance out 
as Panama? Is it going to be farther out? Is it going to be less growth? Well, it's right here. There's going to be way more growth. Why? Because capital is a resource. The more capital you produce, the more production you can do in the future because capital is a shifter of the curve. You can get more output by producing more capital. So I know it seems like I'm rushing through this stuff and I'm not trying to, but just trust me, this first unit at the beginning stuff is really easy. That's why I'm going really fast. Trust me, you're gonna get it, it's easy. Now I'm gonna slow down. This is something that's a lot trickier. It's called specialization in trade. It's this idea of comparative advantage. All right, it starts off easy. The idea of absolute advantage, people are sometimes better at producing than other people. So some people can produce things better than other people. This is the idea of absolute advantage. They can produce more output or they can use fewer resources to produce the same output as some other person. They're just better at making things. Now, the United States probably has an absolute advantage in the production of shoes. I and mean, we could probably produce a boatload of shoes if we wanted to because we could. And we're just a very large, powerful, productive country. But we don't produce shoes. We could. We probably could produce the most in the entire world but we don't. We specialize in other things that we produce instead. We let other countries specialize in shoes. Now that's the idea of comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is the idea of having the production, having a lower opportunity cost. So I can produce this at a lower opportunity cost than somebody else. The United States produces very few shoes, but we produce a whole lot of things like airplanes or CGI movies, right? Movies like Pixar movies, we produce a lot of computer movies because that's what we're good at. And we have a lower opportunity cost than another country who can't produce those things. The idea here is that countries should specialize in trade when they have a comparative advantage. If you're better at producing something than I am, and I'm not as good as that producing that thing, and I'll specialize in the thing that I'm really good at, we both can trade and we can both benefit, right? So I'll trade you the movies, you trade me the shoes, we both walk away happier. This is a production possibilities curve. It shows you how much sugar and wheat the US can produce and how much sugar and wheat Brazil can produce. Now, first question, which country has an absolute advantage in the production of sugar? Well, the United States, they can produce 30 tons and Brazil can only produce 20 tons. So United States can produce more sugar. Now, who has an absolute advantage in the production of wheat? Well, the United States, they produce 30 and Brazil can only produce 10. So you can see United States has an absolute advantage in both. Now, people assume that if United States can produce more of both, we should produce both, but we don't. This is the idea of international trade and comparative advantage. So I'm going to work backwards here, but stay with me. Let's say the United States specializes in wheat and Brazil specializes in producing the sugar and they trade one wheat for one and a half sugar. And I'll, I'll explain how I got that number later, but just stay with me. Take a look at this new production possibilities curve. This is the new numbers based on the trade. If the United States produces all wheat, then they can produce 30 wheat, right? They're down here, they're producing 30 wheat, and they trade one of their wheat, and they get one and a half sugar. They trade another one wheat, they get another one and a half sugar with the trade. All right, look down at this number, 20 wheat and 15 sugar. 20 wheat, it's right here, 15 sugar is outside the curve. They're producing, in fact, they're, they're consuming, not producing, they're consuming outside the curve by trading because they're getting that sugar at a lower opportunity cost than if they produce it themselves. Look at Brazil. If Brazil produced all sugar, they produce 20 sugar, they can trade one and a half sugar to get one wheat, another one and a half sugar for one wheat, another one and a half sugar. Look at this number here, five and 10. Five sugar is here, 10 wheat is out here. For both countries, after trade, their curves can shift outward and they can consume more than if they could produce on their own, right? That's the idea of the benefits of trade. Now, the question is, how did I get those numbers? This is the tricky part. What you gotta do when you do these questions, first, you gotta convert the graphs into a chart. So I've got the countries, US and Brazil. On the top, I've got wheat, I've got sugar. Now I just plug in the numbers. The United States can produce 30 wheat or 30 sugar. Brazil can produce 10 wheat or 20 sugar. So absolute advantage is really easy to spot. It's just whichever country can produce more in this case. So the United States can produce more wheat. They have an absolute advantage in the production of wheat and in sugar. Now, time to calculate comparative advantage. To figure out the comparative advantage, you gotta figure out who has a lower opportunity cost. So you have to calculate what's called the per unit opportunity cost for each country. Now it starts off pretty easy. And by the way, the way I set it up is how I would do it with my students. Set up the chart, Draw it out every single time like this and practice this over and over again. Your review packet has several practice questions, but don't do them yet. Wait till I cover this first. And I'm also gonna give you a trick, so keep watching. For uh, the US, one wheat costs one sugar. If they produce one wheat, they're giving up one sugar, that's their opportunity cost. For uh, US, one sugar costs one wheat. That, that's an easy one. Now, here's my question. For Brazil, how much does each one wheat cost? Well, that right answer is two. 
One wheat costs two sugar. It's two sugars they could have produced, but they can't produce it when they're producing wheat. And on the other side, each one of the sugar is the reciprocal, it's one half. So if they produce 20 sugar and they could be producing 10 wheat, well, each one of the sugar costs one half a wheat they gave up. Now that we have this, we can figure out the comparative advantage because we can find out who has a lower opportunity cost. So which country should be producing the wheat? Who has a comparative advantage in wheat? Well, the United States. They have a lower opportunity cost and only cost them one sugar compared to Brazil that cost them two sugars, so they have a lower opportunity cost. When they write these questions, you can't have a comparative advantage for both. So if you see a test question and you find out that U.S. has a comparative advantage in wheat, you're done. You know for a fact that Brazil has the comparative advantage in sugar. But it always work out that way. But look at the numbers. It makes sense, too. One half is less than one. The point is, to figure out comparative advantage, you got to calculate something called per unit opportunity cost. Now, there's two different types of questions. There's output questions and there's input questions. So for this one, we've got Canada, Mexico. This is number of planes they can produce right here, and this is the cars they can produce. So planes and cars. This is gonna be an output question. Now, on a test question, they would give you more information. They'd say, oh, this is number of planes and cars that Canada and Mexico can produce. But I'm just setting it up. That's the idea of an output question. Now, which country, real quick, has an absolute advantage in the production of planes? Well, Canada. They can produce more planes than Mexico. Which country has an absolute advantage of production of cars? Yeah, Canada. They can produce 20 and Mexico can only produce 10. So Canada has an absolute advantage in both goods. Very true. Now let's go look down here. This next one is the idea of Australia, US. This is number of phones. If they produce 100 phones, this is if they produce 1,000 bikes. This is the number of hours it takes to produce those 100 phones. Now, this is called an input question because the resource is what's variable here. So 50 hours to take uh, to produce 100 phones. This one, U.S. takes 40 hours to produce 100 phones. And over here, Australia takes 20 hours to produce 1,000 bikes. U.S. takes 10 hours to produce those 1,000 bikes. Now, the question is, who has an absolute advantage in the production of phones? The answer is the U.S. Notice. Now you're looking for a smaller number because we're looking for hours. It's better to use fewer resource, in this case, fewer hours, to uh, produce the phones. And over here, who has an absolute advantage in the production of bikes? Well, the US, they take fewer hours. Notice the numbers are exactly the same. They're exactly the same numbers, 50, 40, 20, 10, 50, 40, 20, 10. The, what matters is what the question's asking. If it's an input question, and we're looking at hours, or if an output question, and we're looking at the number of things they're producing, the stuff they're actually making. Now, you can figure this question out by doing what I showed you earlier, calculating the per unit opportunity cost for Canada. So in this case, it'd be one plane cost, I'll put equal signs for cost, a certain number of cars given up. In this case, it'd be two fifths of a car given up. Right? Now you can do that, but it's really time consuming and some students get uncomfortable and it becomes difficult for them. So here's a trick, it's called the quick and dirty. Now the reason why it's called the quick and dirty because it is super quick, but it's dirty. It's so academically dirty. It's just, it's not cheating. It's just like, bleh. you're not gonna learn anything. You just, it's just a trick that's gonna work every single time. And all the people who didn't watch the video up to this point, well, they missed out because you're gonna get the quick and dirty. Go ahead and tell all your friends about it. Mr. Clifford did the quick and dirty with me. It was exciting. First, you understand the idea that there's only two possible outcomes that's gonna happen here to get comparative advantage. Canada should be producing the planes and Mexico would produce the cars, right? So it would be this situation right here. It would be this, I'm gonna draw a diagonal, diagonal representing Canada would be producing planes and then Mexico cars. Or the other option is Mexico is gonna be producing the planes and Canada is gonna be the cars. So this other is the other possibility. Remember, you can't have a comparative advantage in both products. They can't have a comparative advantage producing both. So here's the quick and dirty. So 50 times 10 gives you a certain total number of things produced, which would be 500. Right, so that's again, that's 50 times 10. Or the other one is 40 times 20. 40 times 20 is 800. Now, since 800 is more than 500, that means that is the right answer. Bam, quick and dirty. No doubt about it, guaranteed. You can do all the other calculations if you want. Mexico is gonna be producing the planes and the Canada is gonna be producing the cars, right? Again, here's how I got it. I multiplied the possible outcomes. It's either this or this, the one that gave me the most, because that's what I want, I want the most stuff. Right, that means as a comparative advantage, right? That's the idea of getting comparative advantage and it is quick and it is dirty. Now let's go down here, except remember, we're doing an input question. So we're doing the same thing. It's 50 right here times 10, which we already said is 500, or it's gonna be the other option, which is 40 times 20, which is 800. 
So which one's the right option? Well, it's definitely 500. Now you're gonna use less hours to produce the phones and bikes. And so no doubt about it, US should be producing the bikes. And right here, Australia should be producing the phones. Again, you could do all the other calculations if you wanted to, but this is a quick and dirty way to get the right answer. Okay, how you doing? You with me? You get the concepts? All right, we're gonna take it to the next level. We're gonna learn this idea of what's called terms of trade. Terms of trade is that both countries can benefit, but they don't benefit at every single term of trade. For example, they have to have a certain number of cars traded for a certain number of planes to benefit both countries. So an example I gave you earlier was one wheat for one and a half sugar for Brazil and the US would benefit both countries. How did I come with that number? Well, that's what you're gonna figure out. Again, it's called terms of trade. It's the agreed upon conditions that would benefit both countries. So we've got an example question. Kenya, India, pineapples, radios, 30, 10, 40, and 40. What I want you to do right now is I want you to pause this video. I want you to figure out who has an absolute advantage in pineapples and radios, who has a comparative advantage in pineapples and radios. Also, I want you to try, I know you don't want to, I know you want to do the quick and dirty, but I want you to try to actually calculate the per unit opportunity cost for each one of those and figure out who has a lower opportunity cost, all right? All right, pause the video, see how you do. Okay, you got it? Here we go. For Kenya, each one of those pineapples costs one third of a radio they gave up. Right, and each one of the radios costs three pineapples. Now, though, India is pretty easy. It's one pineapple costs one radio, one radio costs one pineapple. Now that we're there, it's time to figure out who has a comparative advantage, who has a lower opportunity cost. And it's easy because you have the numbers, right? Pineapples, one third, uh, I'm sorry, for Kenya, it costs one third of radio. For India, it costs one radio. Who would you rather have producing the pineapples? The one that has a lower opportunity cost. So, Kenya should produce pineapples. Again, I'm circling the one that has the lower opportunity cost, the one who should specialize in pineapples. Right? India has a lower opportunity cost, one compared to three, lower opportunity cost in producing the radios, and so they have a comparative advantage. Now, let's use the quick and dirty to check to see if you're actually right. 30 times 40 gives you 1,200. 40 times 10 gives you 400. 1,200 is higher, that must be its right answer, done. Output question. That's the quick and dirty, but we're not done. Remember, we have to learn something called terms of trade. So we have to figure out each one radio can be traded for how many pineapples to benefit both countries. Now, I'll tell you right now, one radio for 10 pineapples is good for one country, but not good for the other country. And one radio for like a half a pineapple is good for one country, but not the other. So there's a, a, a range. You have to get the right number in that range. Now, I'll help you out and figure out how you get this. What you gotta do is you look right here. This tells you, once you've calculated this pre and opportunity cost, the number for one radio for a certain number of pineapples has to be between three and one, right? For example, two would work. So one radio for two pineapples would benefit both countries. But why is that? Well, the reason why is this. If Kenya, Kenya produces radios by themselves, so remember, kinda, uh, kinda, uh, wow. Kenya is producing pineapples, right? They're producing pineapples. If they want to produce radios, they're going to make them themselves or they got to trade for them. If they make them themselves, how much does it cost them? Well, it costs them three pineapples, right? So if they produce them themselves, it costs them three. They'd rather trade two pineapples and get a radio than they would produce, uh, give up three pineapples and get one radio by producing themselves. So this works for Kenya. They're like, awesome, that's a great trade. It's better to give up two than three. But now let's look at India, right? They can produce pineapples on their own. If they do, it's gonna cost them one radio, right? So they produce the pineapple and it's gonna cost them one radio. But in this case, they can give up one radio and get two pineapples, right? They give up one radio, because they're specializing in radios, they can get two pineapples, as opposed to giving up a radio and getting only one pineapple themselves. So in this case, one radio for two pineapples benefits both countries, and that's a terms of trade that is great for both of them. Okay, the last concept you're gonna see in this unit is something called the circular flow model. Now, I'm not gonna explain it here, but there's a video that explains the entire thing. Basically, it shows you the relationship between households and businesses and the government. Again, there's video, it's right there. You click on this, it'll explain the concept. The basics that you need to understand is the idea that businesses supply and demand. They supply products but they demand resources. And individuals, you and me, we also supply and demand, right? We demand products, but we supply our resources in the resource market. So watch that video, it'll explain the whole concept of the circular flow.
Okay, now it's time for you to practice. When you see me do it, it's really easy, right? I can do this, I can figure out terms of trade, I can do all the calculations. Let's see if you can do it. Right now, grab your ultimate review packet, try the output question and the input question that I gave you, check the answers to verify you're actually getting it. Now, if you've watched the videos and you've filled out the packet, right now it's time to do the multiple choice questions for unit one. Try the questions, check your answers. If you're confused, click on the learn more link. It'll send you back to a video to practice, make sure you're getting it, and then move on from there. Thank you so much for watching my videos. Make sure to subscribe, like, and leave a comment. Let me know if this is working. You want me to speed up, you want me to slow down. Tell me what you need and I'll help you learn the concepts. Thank you so much for supporting my channel by getting the awesome ultimate review packet. Hopefully it's helping you learn the concept because I know it will. Thanks for watching, until next time.